All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to the 80s online spin training seminar. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Professor Burkhard Hilleberens is full professor of experimental physics at the University of Kaiserslautern. After studies at the University of Cologne and a postdoctoral stay at the Optical Science Center in Tucson, Arizona, he was associate professor at the University of Karlsruhe in 1994. Since 1995, he is full professor at the University, University of Kaiserslautern. From 2006 to 2014, he was vice president for research, technology, and innovation of the University of Kaiserslautern. From 2016 to 2017, he served as scientific director of the Leibniz Institute for Solid State and Material Research Dresden. His research field is experimental magnetism, in particular on um, magnetics. He's particularly interested in nonlinear non magnetic phenomena, magnetic crystals, magnetic gases, magnetic condensates, and magnetic supercurrent phenomena in view of applications in novel information technologies such as magnetic logics. He currently is president of the European Magnetism Association and chair of the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics, IUPAP, Commission C9 Magnetism. Is member chair of the class of mathematics and natural sciences and vice president of the Academy of Sciences and the Literature Minds. Is member of the National Academy of Science and Engineering. Is also IEEE fellow and APS fellow. In 2005, he was distinguished lecturer of the IEEE Magnetic Society. In 2016, he received an ERC advanced grant of the European Commission. He served on the administrative committee of the IEEE Magnetic Society and was honors and awards chair. Since 2018, he's chair and a member of the scientific advisory board of the Hemholtz Center Dresden Rosendorf and also member of the HZDR supervisory board. He has published more than 450 refereed articles, book contributions, and several patents. Uh, so it is uh, my great pleasure to, uh, to, to welcome Professor Hillebrands to give us a nice talk in advances in coherent magnetics. Uh, Professor Hillebrands, please take it from here. Yeah, thank you very much, Jin, and also thank you very much, Kirill, for, for two things. Number one, for inviting me, but also for setting up this wonderful series, uh, which is always a good end of the week. Uh, a little bit late here in Europe, but nine o'clock is, is still okay, so we can have the glass of wine uh, a little bit later in the night. Okay, today I talk about advances in coherent magnetics. Um, I will make the introduction very short because you see this animation here. All these little arrows are magnetic moments and you can excite them so that you have waves. And you see typical wave properties already here because you see waves reflected from the boundaries. You see waves which actually interfere. You see interference patterns here. And what we actually do is if we have an open day in physics in my university here in Kaiserslautern, then what we have, we have this same animation running, but it is not running automatically. You can simply put your finger somewhere and then spin waves are generated just at the place of your fingers and then you can play around very, very nicely with all different kinds of interference patterns which you can artificially create this way. So, but this is now the subject of how this could be used for a very important application and that is all kinds of computing. You all know the story so that CMOS has limitations and we are looking for alternative ways and I would like to, 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 to simply make here a an, 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 uh, commercial that uh, Magnonics uh, is, might be a very, good, a very good choice. So let's get started. Um, First question, of course, if you would like to use magnons, which are the quanta of the spin waves you just have seen. Uh, so why using spin waves and, and, and magnons? Well, you see a lot of answers here and let's quickly go through it because then you get a good feeling for that. Number one, we can make, we can make the wavelengths very, very small down to the nanometer scale if we wish. So we can increase the frequency up to several terahertz. We have the interference effects and they are easily accessible and this would already have been uh, uh, clear to you when seeing just this opening view graph. Very, very important, we have efficient nonlinear effects and that makes magnonics distinct from photonics or integrated photonics. Um, we can realize macroscopic magnonic wave functions such as those of Bose-Einstein condensates. I will uh, discuss this a little bit more in detail. Everything can run at room temperature, so in a sense we are distinct from quantum computing, which only works today at millikelvins. Um, we don't need to move charges. Uh, we can work in, in insulating materials, so no Julian heat. 
Um, and in general, if you look into wave-based computing, whatever kind of realization you would like to look at, you always will find that this footprint can be made smaller and you can realize an all-wave logic. And finally, technically important, good converters between CMOS technology and our Magnon Spintronics exists, so we can interface it very easily. So this looks very promising. So we dedicated the work in Kaiserslautern just to, to find out um, what kind of, of what kind of computing applications can be made. We are still in the fundamental science domain, but we simply try to reach out. And here are a few examples by different kinds of people. We have made logic gate, and so the natural logic made is a majority gate, but just the log logic state of the output is just a um, superposition or the interference of, of the input state. You see some waves here, some complicated patterns in this device. Um, we work with Magnon condensate. Dima Boschko is among the, the, the listeners today. He was really the, the driving person as part of his PhD work to, 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 to do that. We can build a Magnon transistor where we control the current of Magnons by other Magnons here in the gate area. We can build all kinds of integrated Magnonics. Here is an example which I will actually discuss a little bit longer, uh, which is a directional coupler. You see spin waves coming in one branch and you see how it couples to the other branch. And I would like to mention, lots of this work has been done in two ERC projects. ERC is in, is in Europe, just a very important funding source. And there was Andre Chumak, who has done a lot of this integrated Magnonics. Um, he is not in Kaiserslautern anymore. He got a chair at the University of Vienna and he now starts uh, his own group in Vienna. And I also got an ERC grant for that. So let's get started. Um, so we want to do computing. So what are the Magnon computing principles we have to obey? The strategic conclusions are very straightforward. Number one, we have waves, so we must build on coherency. We should use coherency for the devices. And if that is the case, we have to ask, how can we create coherency? And there are two fundamental ways how to create coherency. Number one, we can create coherency simply by having coherent spin wave sources. Connect your sample to a microwave generator which runs at a single frequency and you create coherent spin waves. And the other way is you can create coherency out of an incoherent environment just by forming condensates. Both are Einstein condensates which are macroscopic quantum states. And this talk I will discuss for these two ways, two examples which I find very prominent. The first one is just the interaction of coherent spin waves. I will show you the stirrup effect and macroscopic quantum analogies. If I say it this way, I am assuming that most of you certainly have not heard what a stirrup effect is. You might have heard about a stirrup effect if you have a history in, in, in molecular physics or atomic physics. There the effect was first discovered and, 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 and it's a quite prominent example. It is a magic effect because I will show you that we can do computing with states which are not occupied. And this of course sounds very magic and has no analogy in the particle world. The other example I'm going to show is how we can do computing based on qubits, which we realize by Bose-Einstein condensates. And that is at the very beginning, so I will show you the concept, what is the idea behind, and where might it lead to, and what is a f also what is, what is a possible market niche for such an approach. So let's get started. But before I get started, of course, I have to mention all the people involved. You see a quite a number of people in red, the most important PhD students or people who have done work during their PhD time. There's Marteza Moseni, he just finished his PhD. He has done the numerical simulation of the Bose-Einstein condensates and discussing this in more detail. We have Dima Boschko, he's now in Colorado, among you. There's Shi Wang, who did also his PhD in Kaiserslautern under the supervision of Andre Chumak. So the green people are always the people who do most of the supervision work. And he moved with, with Andre to Vienna. There is Alexander Kreil, Halina Musienko, Schmarova, who works uh, in my group, which is um, both are finishing their PhD. Uh, I should mention Philip Perot, Vitaly Vazushka, Alexander Saga, Andre Chumak, I was already mentioning, who are very important for supervising our students. And I would also like to acknowledge the work with the collaborators. We need a lot of theory, and we don't have the theory in the group, so we need to have very strong collaborations. And there are in particular Viktor Wolf and Anna Pomialov. Uh, it's a Weizmann Institute. There's Gennady Mel 
Belkov uh, in Kiev, there's Andrei Slavin, Vasil Tuvakevich in your country in the US, and there's Arne Bratas who works in, 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 in Trondheim, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. So now let's really start with the science. So I talk about this very st strange effect, the stirrup effect. And let me give you an introduction But what we are doing here. We will address the problems with magnonic waveguides. And a magnonic waveguide is a rather simple thing. If you have some background in optics, it's very easy for you to understand. So we need a fiber for the magnons. And in our case, that is just a stripe of yttrium iron garnet on a gadolinium gallium garnet substrate. We like to use YIC because it has the lowest damping of any known or practical material, I should say. We apply a field and then we have antennas. Antennas is just a little wire which we have here. And now assume what happens if we connect this wire with a microwave source or an input microwave signal. Then across the wire, you see a cross section of the wire here. So the wire runs into the drawing plane. These Ørsted fields are generated by the microwave current. And these Ørsted fields oscillate with the microwave frequency. So we have a magnetic oscillating field that exerts a torque on the magnetic moment in the gig. And in this way, spin waves are generated. Um, here's one example, which we need a little bit later. If we have such a waveguide, now you see it here from the front running to the back. Here again is the antenna. And uh, what we now need to do, we have to look into the dispersion properties. Yeah, Dispersion of light is boring. It's just a straight line connecting the frequency with a wave vector. Here in this system, in this kind of waveguide structures, we have different modes. For instance, we have this black profile, so no node. We have this red profile, one node in the middle. We have this blue profile, two nodes here in the middle. And you see these are all profiles which are pinned here at the boundary of the waveguide. I have no time really to go into this particular detail, but I think you can simply see that we have different kinds of modes which we can excite. And now if you look into the dispersion properties, you see the dispersion here. Uh, you have to keep in mind we excite the entire system at a given frequency, 7 gigahertz here in this example. So we uh, excite these three modes. First of all, what you see is that the slope in the dispersion is slightly different for the black, the red and the blue mode. And the slope is the group velocity. So all these modes propagate with different velocities. And as a result, what you see is just an interference pattern which we can measure with space and time resolved Brillouin and light scattering. Here we only need the space resolved Brillouin and light scattering. And you see it here in the background. You see we have areas where we have a lot of intensity in the middle. And here you see a very particular spot on the sample but really looks like a hole in the interference pattern. Just a simple interference effect to give you some feeling how, how first of all, how important interference effects are and how easily they are accessible in a, in a good experiment. So this is a multi-mode waveguide like you might know from, from integrated optics, just the analogon to that. Now let's do something more useful with it. This was only the introduction. And we will simply look into the case of two coupled waveguides. So we have a waveguide here, waveguide number one. Here is the other waveguide. We again mount an antenna somewhere. We simply call it the excitation region now, and we will generate spin waves here. And these waveguides are rather close, so they can couple via the dipolar stray fields associated with the spin waves. You see some parameters here. So what will happen, and what I show you now, is a computer simulation, which we have done. And what you see is very nicely here in the excitation regime, spin waves are excited, but due to the coupling, they are just transferring the, the population to the other waveguide. And then it's transferred back. And this happens in an oscillatory manner. Two coupled waveguides, an old problem known since a long time from two optical fibers, which can couple via some leakage. And that can be easily described with a very simple model. You are all aware of just two coupled harmonic oscillators. If you just plot the amplitudes of this red and this green pendulum, you get the same interference patterns here or the same 
time dependencies as you see here 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 in the structure so this works very nicely um, i would like to mention that we use here in a somewhat new um, how should i say it's not really a new approach it's a new new technique maybe and that is simply we combine very uh, intensively now numerical simulations with the experiments you have seen experiments before numerical simulations are extremely helpful because it can tell us what are good parameter spaces how how shall we design an experiment before we do the, the, the real experiment? Today, for the sake of time, I'm mostly showing you numerical simulations. Um, we can, of course, do now uh, this experiment in a re re really real fashion, so we can include the damping, which we always have in GIG. Then if you go away here from the excitation regime, you see some damping here in, in the simulation. So it's all there. So the numerical simulation can really image the experimental situation, situation very, very well. There is one important parameter you should memorize that we call the coupling length. And that is simply the length over which the full population or amplitude or intensity couples from one waveguide here to the other. You see there is no amplitude here and it's all over here. So this length we call the coupling length. Um, if we do so, of course, we can do all the kind of stuff which we know from, from coupled waveguides, coupled harmonic oscillators, and so on and so on. If we have two waveguides, here is one, and here is the other, and you might already see coupling happens here in the area where they are very close to each other, so that the, the stray fields can influence the neighboring waveguide. What happens is if we plot the dispersions, again, frequency as a function of wave number, we get two modes for the two waveguides which are slightly non-degenerate. These, we can classify them as anti-symmetric and symmetric mode. So in an anti-symmetric mode, you see the amplitudes are just always 180 degree out of phase. Symmetric, they are just in phase. So just the usual thing if you have to couple to coupled pendula. And what you see also in this simulation is already a very peculiar case that the amplitude of the upper waveguides couples nearly fully into the, into the lower waveguides. So you see many things can be done. You can play around with this. I will cut it very, very short. For instance, we just can fix the geometry. It's always the same geometry. And we simply can change the frequency of the microwave generator exciting the system. And then depending on the frequency, all the intensity goes in the other waveguide. We have, or we can achieve a 50-50 splitting or all the intensity it stays in the same waveguide and that is simply a, 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 a consequence that the coupling length is slightly frequency dependent it's all interference if you change the frequency you change the wavelength and i think it is quite intuitive that, that then these kind of patterns can happen yeah. so we can even build a frequency multiplexer but that is a very small detour so we have a, a signal consisting of two frequencies and then at the end you can pick up the two frequencies here here it's the two outputs so many things things can be thought of. So we can use this directional coupler as interconnectors, as multiplexer, as power dividers. We can even do apply different magnetization directions and we have a switch built in. So all these kind of ideas are around. But I have to leave this now because I now would really like to discuss the stirrup phenomenon. Okay, I think I need, I owe you to explain what we are now discussing, what is now the problem. And let's just think about a very simple physical problem, just a three-level quantum system, like you find it in atom physics, in molecular physics. So we have three states, state number one and state number two. And our job is to transfer population from state number one to state number two. But very unfortunately, this transition is dipole forbidden. So we cannot simply use a laser whose frequency is just equal to, 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 the, to the distance here and energy between these two states to transfer the population. But fortunately, a third state is around, which you see here. So what we can do, we can transfer the population from state one to state number three using a blue laser. So the Rabi frequency is just uh, 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 taken as the frequency of the laser. And then with a second laser, let's say it's a red laser here, we can transfer the population from three to two. So straightforward. 
And this experiment was actually done, and I'm a little bit proud on that, because it was done in Kaiserslautern in 1990 by my colleague, Klaus Bergmann. And this happened long before I even could spell the name Kaiserslautern. I've never been in Kaiserslautern at that time. I arrived in Kaiserslautern in 1995, and my first visit to Kaiserslautern was a job interview. So this was pre-existing knowledge in Kaiserslautern. And, uh, Actually, if we first transfer from one to three and then from, from three to two, that is a very intuitive approach. And therefore, we call this simply the intuitive approach. So just to remember, the direct transition from one to two is forbidden, so we need to pass via three, and we can do it in this intuitive scheme. This means as a function of time, first apply this blue laser pulse, a little bit later the red laser pulse, and then we hope that all the population is in state number two. That works. It's inefficient, especially if the lifetime of this state number three is very low. And then things happen. And what happened is that the student didn't listen to the supervisor carefully enough and she did the experiment in a different way. They simply applied by accident first the red laser pulse and then the blue laser pulse. And you might ask what happens if I first apply the red laser pulse. There is no population here. Yeah. So what can you do if you just have an empty state, you can transfer nothing to the other state. And if you later then, uh, of course, transfer the, the blue laser pulse, you basically transfer population from here to there. But of course, then, then, then the case is lost. And that is very counterintuitive. What turns out, this is a very efficient effect to transfer population from one to two. In quantum mechanical language, you would say, okay, you generate an entangled state with a blue, with a red laser pulse, you entangle these two states, and then with some coherency, you basically transfer the population from one to two. Yeah, that is quantum mechanical language. And this, of course, is very interesting. It is a very important mechanism now in molecular physics. And the idea was picked up by other people. For instance, um, uh, can it be translated to optics? Yes, it can be translated to optics. And that's what, what was done by Stefano Longhi a couple of years ago. And what he does is simply to replace this scenario by a waveguide scenario. And you, three, you see three waveguides, waveguide number one, waveguide number two, we want to transfer from one to two, and an intermediate waveguide here in the middle. And you see that the waveguide, the closest point for this waveguide number one and three is different from the closest point of waveguide number three to waveguide number two. And if we now let the waves propagate from the bottom to the top, then essentially we'll replace the time coordinate now with the space coordinate is that, so this is the Z coordinate. And uh, since we have coupling here, we can replace the Rabi frequencies here by the coupling strengths kappa. And if you write down the mass with an Hamiltonian here, it looks very, very simple. And all you need to acknowledge at this point is simply that for this waveguide problem, the, the symmetry of the equations looks very much the same. It is the same, like if you would just do the time dependent pro problem, which we have first discussed. So, of course, this brings up the case of a question, can we do it with magnonics? And uh, that is what I would like to show you. So that is our sample, all made out of YIC. We have the two narrowest points, which are separated here by a certain distance. You see all the parameters. I think I don't need to go through this. And now let's see what happens. And of course, we first have to do the intuitive scheme. So we just generate spin waves here with this, with this yellow spin wave generator, just a little while. The spin waves propagate, they couple to the center waveguide. If we choose other parameters right, then most of the intensity goes to center waveguides. And a little bit later or to the right, everything can couple to the lower waveguide. And you see, if we tweak really the parameter, most of the intensity we get to the lower waveguide. But you also see, even if we try our very best, there's still some remaining population here. And now it's up to you to guess what happens. I do not want to spoil the story if we do it for the counterintuitive case. And here it is. All we do is to use exactly the same geometry, but we now move the excitation source from the upper waveguide to the lower waveguide. So we couple in here, the spin waves propagate, they couple to the center waveguide just here. And then you see we excite some kind of, of, of evanescent modes in here. And then at the very end, 
it goes up here in the upper wave guide. And you see nothing is excited here. So we get all the population transferred. So the counterintuitive scheme works, the stirrup mechanism works. And what is very, very remarkable, we do now transfer of population, transfer of energy, if you like, or if you like to speak more Magnonics language, transfer of angular momentum without significantly exciting here the center wave guide. This phenomenon has a name, it's called dark state. In optics, you also find dark states in quantum optics. But to be precise, it's not the center waveguides which creates the dark state. The dark state is actually this coherent state which combines the, the, the waves in all three waveguides. So it works. And since we are in magnonics, we now can play out all the, all the tools we have and all the possibilities we have. And a computer experiment, which is very straightforward, is simply to play around on the computer with the damping. And in this experiment, we have made the damping of the center waveguides 50 times larger than the two other ones. And now see what happens. If we do the scheme which is intuitive, you'll see because we have this large damping here in the center waveguide, very little comes out. But if we do it now for the counterintuitive scheme, you'll see there is no damping. There's only the residual damping which happens because we have a finite lifetime of the magnons, but all the rest just gets through. And of course, this we can even do much better. We can calculate now, you know, in this, well, we can infer from the computer simulation the normalized spin wave power which comes out as a function of damping. And if we have the intuitive case, you see damping is very strong. But in this counterintuitive case where we have the strong damping, with increasing damping, you see it virtually not, not, not changing. And, and, and all the energy, all the population is transferred to the other wave gap. So there is really now wave processing in magnonics with a dark state, so with, 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 with states um, where, where certain areas of the sample are not at all excited, but the coupling happens via these non-excited states. And this I find personally very, very, very interesting. So what I wanted to show is that spin wave directional coupler can be an important building block of magnonics for future wave-based technology. Uh, this is called quantum classical analogy phenomena. Uh, the, what I showed you was Landau Lifshitz type simulations. This was the code we used was mu max 3, and mu max 3 is a classical code. There is no quantum mechanics problem. Quantum mechanics is only present because we have a magnetic system and magnetism is quantum mechanics, but all the excitations is classical wave physics. So therefore it's called quantum classical analogy because we know the phenomena from the quantum world, but we can also find them in, as a classical analogy in our systems. So we have the magnetic stirrer process. Yeah. And it is the first demonstration of a device with coherently coupled building blocks and the formation of a magnonic dark state. So I think there is quite some future in it because we now have all means to manipulate the center waveguide and we can manipulate it. Also, there is no population. Isn't it crazy? Yeah. But I think I showed you that it is really so coherent wave functions in the coupling regime of all three waveguides, which finally gives you an answer why that is. So that is, I think, the best we have at the moment in my lab in Kaiserslautern in terms of, of coherent magnonics, where we start with coherent waves. So let me now show you that we can do even more, that we can work with macroscopic quantum states and use them for computing. And here we build on the fact that we can create macroscopic wave functions by using magnonic Bose-Einstein condensates in, in, in order to have them. A macroscopic wave function is just a wave function, nothing else. But you have seen before was also a wave function, but the macroscopic Bose-Einstein wave functions have the big advantage that the phase or the, and the coherency are the order parameters. So the phase of a Bose-Einstein condensate is not predetermined. So we get a new quantity that we get a hand on, that is a manipulation of the face. Uh, and this I would like to show you. There are many ways how to create it. I will show you the most convenient way. I will show you also the extension. This goes far beyond that, what, what Dima has done during his, his PhD work. And that is really to look what happens with these condensates if we go to very small structures. So if we induce quantization effects, finite size effects in these condensates, and then it becomes even, even more interesting, I personally find. Um, there are new ways how to do it. One way is rapid cooling. I very 
it very quickly, address that. And then I think the most important part of my, the rest of my presentation is that we can create magnonic qubits and I will show you recipes how magnonic qubit calculus could, could be realized. So just to summarize this, the main idea is we have to find macroscopic magnonic quantum states. They provide some macroscopic wave functions. And this is analogous to that what you know from instance from, from, from superconductivity where we have Josephson currents and also superfluidity. Just one remark, we can make our systems dissipation free because in superconducting, superconducting people always ask where is the dissipation free transport? We can show dissipation free transport and that is dissipation free transport of excitations on a condensate. The condensate itself, so that is a good message. The, the bad message is that the condensate itself is always dissipative because of residual coupling of the microns to the phonons in the system. Okay, background. We have seen dispersion curves. That is the dispersion curve, or that are the dispersion curves of a film, which is in-plane magnetized. So we plot again the frequency as a function of the wave vector. Um, we have modes where the propagation Q is a wave vector is perpendicular to the field. The film is in-plane magnetized. And that is, other people know this as a surface mode. So this pink mode is a surface mode. And since we work with a film of finite thickness, we also get all kinds of standing waves. These are waves traveling between the front side and the back side. And if you plot them as a function of the wave number parallel to the film surface, we get all this, this modes here. So the spacing is determined by the film thickness. We can also propagate parallel to the field. Then we get this blue curve. Yeah. It is blue initially with increasing wave vector. The frequency is decreasing. That is simply a fact that in this case we can reduce the macroscopic stray fields. So the stray field energy is reduced, therefore the frequency goes down. And then for larger wave vectors, the typical exchange properties set in. So if you like, so this, this red pinkish part is dipolar dominated and the bluish part is, 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 is exchange dominated. What is important here, again, we get the standing modes here in, in this case too. And you'll see we have a quasi continuum of modes here, which we can populate. But what you should really infer from this figure is number one, there is a minimum frequency, which is finite, it is non-zero. And the other is we have two minima in the system. Yeah? These are just the orange point. And you might already guess, these are the position of the Bose-Einstein condensates once we create them. Um, if you would like to describe such a system, we have to do the thermodynamics, right? And the thermodynamics simply tells you, since we are discussing bosons, magnons are bosons, we have to use the Bose-Einstein distribution function. If d as a function of omega is the density of states, then rho as a function of omega is, a, is the density of the occupied states, that is just this density multiplied by the Bose-Einstein factor. And what enters here is the frequency of the modes, so just here all these modes, is the temperature, but also the chemical potential. And if you ask yourself, how can we achieve both the Einstein function, you see the recipe here already. Simply assume that you make the chemical potential equal to the minimum frequency, then this difference here is zero, the exponential term is unity, and in the denominator we have unity minus unity, so we get a divergence in the, in, in the population of this, of, of, this, of, of this states. So the population, a divergent population, is always a very good fingerprint for a Bose-Einstein condensate. Of course, you also have to show for full proof the coherency. So that is the recipe. And now you know what you need to do. You have to manipulate the chemical potential. If you have an open system, like the atmosphere surrounding you, all these gas molecules have chem zero chemical potential because the system is open. So if you would like to get a finite chemical potential, you have somehow to, to disturb very strongly this equilibrium. Um, so I can skip that. Uh, let me skip this part. One way to disturb the equilibrium is simply open your hands, fill your hands with magnons, and throw these magnons into the system. And a very convenient way how to realize that physically is a process of parametric pumping that is very simple. We simply use a microwave source with a frequency which we call omega pump. 
Then each microwave photon decays into two magnons, and these magnons have half the frequency for energy conservation, and they have opposite wave vectors for momentum conservation. On this scale, the microwave photons have nearly zero wave vector. And then what happens is all these excess magnons here undergo four magnon scattering, very analogous to two molecules in the atmosphere surrounding do they also like to scatter so four magnon scattering is important this happens with energy momentum conservation and this leads to an equilibrium of all these states and if you do it right you get some kind of cooling effect we call it evaporative cooling actually it's very similar mechanism like your coffee cup or tea cup which gets colder over the time and then after some time, if your conditions are right, your Bose-Einstein condensation may form in this orange point. And at this point, please realize that we always get, for symmetry reasons, two condensates, one at a positive wave vector value and one at a negative wave vector value. So the key element is really we need to ex create excess magnons. They cannot relax within the system relaxation time, and therefore we get the finite chemical potential. And there are many ways how to do it. For instance, one way we recently have done, we like to call time scale injection. And that simply means that we change the temperature of our system very, very rapidly, much faster than the relaxation times. Again, this creates a non-equilibrium state. And again, we can show that this results in Bose-Einstein condensation. I have no time to go more into this. Um, what I would like to show you now is that we can simulate it on the computer. For a long time, this was a forbidden experiment because everybody was saying Bose-Einstein condensation is a quantum mechanical process. Here, I provide you now with a proof that this is a classical process because everything has been done with MUMAX 3. So what Morteza, he has done these simulations, has done, he has simulated a Yig stripe, he has simulated an electric wire here on top, and he has simulated a microwave current through the wire, including the dynamic Ørsted's fields, which are then surrounding the wire, and including the torques this Ørsted field is generating on the moments. And that is his result. What you see here is, before we start the experiment, just the dispersion for a very thin film, only 85 nanometers thick. And you see now that all these modes, the standing modes here, have a much larger separation. That is simply due to the fact that, that, that the spacing is larger for thinner films. But you still can identify the backward volume mode here. You still can identify the minimum here and the other minimum on the other side. So here the modes are numbered with n equal 1, n equal 2, and n equal 3. And now let's switch on on the computer the microwave source. And you see, we pump here in the state. Yeah, and the state is, gets populated. Also, some magnon pairs go here into these states at larger wave vectors. You see that is the blue, bluish is a little, little bit lighter than in the areas in between. And now we can wait a little bit. Then the four magnon scattering sets in. Four magnon scattering always means you have to take two magnons and you have to make out of the two magnons another pair of magnons under energy and momentum conservation. So two magnons here might just scatter in these two, these two, these two states, which you find here on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the lowest branch, or two magnons here might scatter in this state, and there's another state over there under energy conservation. And these are just equilibrium, equilibrium generating processes now in our system. And if you now wait a little bit longer, that is still here for magnon scattering, then uh, after some time, um, if you switch off the microwave, then all the magnons collect here at the bottom. And that is the first proof that indeed both Einstein condensation can be simulated on a computer. I should say that Arne Bratasch has tried to do it. Um, he hasn't put very much effort into it. And then Morteza, Mossini was the first who really was able to show that this works. And then we collaborated with, with, with Arne really to find out the parameter space. And this was a very, very fruitful discussion. And I would like to thank Arne here for this collaboration for this talk. So it all works. We can do many things. We can uh, uh, check the thresholds for magnon scattering, for magnon condensation. The typical decay time is 100 nanoseconds. So this is all very well represented. And now we can play around. Um, actually, I, I owe you a proof that this is really a condensate. Here is an experiment where we have very quickly cooled the system. 
And I show this only because in this case, we can experimentally measure the chemical potential. So what you find here in black is just um, the, the, the frequency of the bose einstein condensate. It changes a little bit with time because we cool and heat the system, heat and cool the system actually in this order. And here is the chemical potential. And you see for bose einstein condensation, indeed, in this measurement, uh, you see that they match each other and there's no adjustable parameter by which we could shift this red curve up and down. That is really a measured quantity. Okay, now can we do something useful with this? And this is now the last part I would like to show you the last minutes. And that is we can realize Mark non qubits. And you all might know what a qubit state is. Here you see one. It's just two coherent states. We call it plus and minus state. And if we now look into the superposition of these two states, then we have a qubit state. And it is described by the two complex amplitudes A and B. Um, to realize that, we might remember that we have the two condensates. So the state number plus will be represented by the BEC as a positive wave vector, BEC plus and the minus state corresponding lead to BC minus. So we can realize now Q states. It is very convenient to plot them using the instrument of a Bloch sphere. A Bloch sphere is a unit sphere. And if we only have populated this green state as so a plus state, then we represent it with the North Pole, with the position at the North Pole. And correspondingly, if we would only have the minus state, that would correspond to the South Pole. And any superposition here in between um, is just represented by a location here on the surface of the Bloch state, for instance, here is this red state. We can also characterize it with the azimuthal angle, with the polar angle theta and the azimuthal angle phi in the usual manner. So this works very nicely. Um, I was already mentioning, we have done all the simulation with classical tools. So the question is, this kind of object, what is it? Is it quantum mechanics? Is it classic? The answer is straight, straightforward. We cannot prove that it is not classic. So we are inclined to say it's a classic state. Does it harm us? Is it useful to look into it? And that needs a little bit more diving into the literature. And I have made here this comparison for you. If we talk about quantum mechanical computing, quantum computing in short, um, you know, we work with qubits again, but you know that entanglement is very important. For instance, if, if we talk about encryption. There is an analogon to that, which is not, of course, which is not really entanglement, but the analogon is non-separability. We can realize states, for instance, uh, a, a certain a certain Bell states, even in a, in a classic manner, which are non-separable, which means we cannot factorize them. Noise, in quantum mechanical world, we have quantum noise here, we have classical noise, which is a slight advantage. Um, more important is if you look into the algorithms, um, in quantum mechanics, of course, very important is to do fast Fourier transform. But the good news is that it's quite a couple of years ago that there's also classical algorithms for wave-based computing, classical wave-based computing, where you find algorithms for fast Fourier transform, which still show polynomial, polynomial scaling. So if you think about P, N, P, all this kind of discussion, there is space where it can be done. And these algorithms are much faster than Boolean logic. They are, of course, not as fast as quantum mechanical approach. But this might already tell you at this point, I have no time to go deeper into this, that there is a very significant and very interesting window where this kind of technology, if it is really made a technology, can have very interesting applications. I always like to say, I would like to have a quantum computer in my wristwatch. Yeah, uh, but this is difficult because then I have to miniaturize a fridge which can do a couple of mini Kelvin in my in, in, in my wristwatch, and that is certainly technologically not achievable. But maybe there's a chance that I can do a, a Mark non-based qubit computer in my watch and, and, and miniaturize this way. There are other algorithms, I have no time to go through it, but I just want to convince you there's an interesting field. 
description. Usually people like to use the gross Pitayevsky equation. It has everything in it that is why I show the view graph. So the dispersion, you have seen so much dispersion pictures today. The self-interaction between magnons in a condensate, the cross-interaction between magnons between the two condensates, external potential, external forces, and that can be used if you would like to drive the theory forward. And if you like to know to calculate these kind of things, if we pump the system, we get the magnon density as a function of frequency. We get a nice distribution, which we actually understand in all the details. But if we do the BEC, you see again here in this picture, how the, the density here diverges at the BEC frequency. So this all works very well. Again, here, a very nice simulation. That this is interesting and that a computer simulation can tell us very interesting predictions. I would just to like to show you here, because once we have that, we can let these two Bose-Einstein condensate, condensates interfere. And here is the interference pattern, just calculated from the numerical simulation. And to look at this, we find vortices. So the same story like in superconductivity, we have vortices, and we even now have no view graph to show this to you, have first indications that there is something like a, a magnonic vortex Hall effect, so we can move these vortices around with, 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 with some generalized forces. So it's all there. Okay, now finally computing. We have to fulfill two tasks. Task is number one is we have to initialize a well-defined state. Let's say this green North Pole, this blue South Pole, or any red state. And then, of course, we have to move the magnum qubit states around in order to realize logic functionality. So we have to find the corresponding unitary transformations. Um, there are many ways what can be done. I will show you only one example uh, that is wave vector selective parametric pumping, where we only populate the North Pole. Um, we also have to manipulate the azimuthal angle. Today I have no time to show this. We have recipes for that and I will only indicate how this could be done. A very, very important tool for that is something we have discussed uh, about 10 years ago, that is magnonic crystals. A magnonic crystal is very simple. We just have periodic disturbances in the material. And a very easy way is just to put some wires across the Yig crystal and then put a current through it, for instance, a DC current. Then we locally change the field, so we get just a field which just is not periodically varying across the crystal along the propagation direction. And what happens is that Bragg reflection sets in. So these are the disturbances, and you see if we scatter from these disturbances, we can have a situation where they all coherently superimpose in a constructive manner. The Bragg reflection is here that an integer multiple of the wavelengths must match twice the periodicity here. What happens is in this case that in the dispersion, this is the backward volume mode here, gaps open. You know this all very well from electronic band structure. You know that a semiconductor is created because you create a, back, a gap in the band structure. Just the same thing here for magnonics, uh, the dispersion curve. And if that happens, and if you assume that you have a population here and you switch on the magnonic crystal, for instance, by switching on the DC current through such a magnonic crystal, then you will just transfer the population from here to that position and so on and so on. It will oscillate. And that is actually very simple, very, very, very interesting. So Morteza has done it on a computer. So he, had, he has studied with only populating the BEC plus state. He waits a little bit. Then you see that between here and there, most of the population is transferred from the positive BEC to the negative BEC. He can do it as a function of time on his computer, and then he gets all these oscillations. And here you should stop for a second and think, what, what is it? And it is nothing else than Rabi oscillations, but not Rabi oscillations between two energy levels, like you have seen at the first part of my talk, but Rabi oscillations between two states which are separated in wave vector space namely the BEC plus at a positive wave vector and BEC minus at a negative wave vector. So we have it all here. 
And of course, this we now can use to manipulate because we can simply apply the magnonic crystal for a certain time. And depending on the time for which the magnonic crystal is switched on, we populate, we transfer the population and we can control how much population should be in the other condensate. So that is already one way. There are more ways. And I would like to show you a very, very interesting approach. And for that, we just change a little bit the setup. Again, the, the sample geometry is the same. So Yig stripe periodic wires. But now we connect these wires to a microwave generator with different phases for the wires. So microwave signal. And if the first wire has, let's say, phase zero, then the next wire is shifted in phase by pi over two, the next one by pi, the next one by three pi over two, and this one by four pi, that is the same like, like, like zero, of course. And if we do so, we can calculate the Ørsted fields. So very, very simple, it's classical electrodynamics. So that is just the Ørsted fields. The wires run into the drawing plane. So you just see the cross section here by the, by the white squares. And now if we do a simulation, if you apply a microwave current, what will happen? So these are the Ørsted fields. And you see the Ørsted fields move because of, of, of the phase difference. They move from the right to the left. Yeah. What does it mean if we use that now to do parametric pumping of our condensate, then this moving Ørsted fields can be represented by an effective wave vector which is provided by this magnonic crystal. So we are not pumping here anymore, but we are pumping by an effective wave vector which is just shifted by the wave vector provided by this dynamic magnonic crystals. And if you provide now the photons here, they will not decay into magnons in the blue area. They will decay into magnons here in this green area. So we only populate, if you like to name it like this, the North Pole. And here is the experiment, the computer experiment. It works remarkably well. Only BEC plus is populated and no mark nodes or very few mark nodes go here into the BEC minus. So we can select states. We can select the North Pole. We can select the South Pole. And I should also add, we can manipulate the phase. So if you have any state populated between the North Pole and the South Pole, then we can shift the phase here in between. Phase shifting is very, very important because we have to use an existing condensate with an existing phase and we need to shift that phase. We don't need to set the phase, we need to shift the phase, but it's much harder to do. But this is an approach how it could do. And in this way, you can now realize all, all the necessary protocols. A very a famous example is the Hadamard gate. The Hadamard gate turns the North Pole into a state in the plus x direction and conversely a south pole in this a minus x direction so this cannot be realized by superposition of that um, there's even more you can do for instance you can apply a short a, a little rf field then you only slightly change the frequency if we shift from here to there that is possible then we occupy this state which will quickly relax into the condensate but if we shift from green to blue, there are no states here. So this transition is forbidden. Again, a mechanism how to shift around um, populations of condensates between the two condensates in a very controlled manner. OK, I'm coming to my end. Very last. Of course, this were single qubit operations. We have to think about multi-qubit operations. And there are many ways how to do it. For instance, we can couple two BECs with a gap. We have done this in the past. Uh, uh, we have seen Josephson oscillations between the two condensates. Uh, we can also separate them just by an electric current carrying wire, which separates the two condensates. Condensates are just symbolized here with the screen areas. Or we can just use a multi antenna construction. So it's just by induction, these wires pick up. The, the, the condensates amplitude and phase and transfer it to, to the next BC in a phase coherent manner. So if you like, you can even identify this as a geometry which corresponds to a flying qubit in, in, in quantum optics. So it's all there. And our task now at the moment is to turn these ideas into not only working computer experiments, which we have largely done, but also into working real experiments where we can really prove our assumptions 
this with this prolonged light scattering results, or, or in some cases also possible, this microwave experiment results. With this, I would like to add, and here is a summary of my second time, second part. So we can create Magnon condensates. Uh, we, this, we studied their behavior in confined nano and microstructures. We did a lot of micromagnetic modeling and also brillo light scattering spectroscopy. I had no time to show you with the data, but they are just in very good agreement. We can create a Magnon qubit based on the two condensates. Um, and we find recipes for the initialization for qubits and also for qubit protocols. And with this, I would like to end. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, inspiring talk. And uh, okay, his reaction is to thank the speaker. Uh, if you have any question, please uh, you raise hand and you can do that by clicking the uh, reaction button. Uh, the first question will be uh, by Professor Hu. Please go ahead. Okay. Back at, uh, as always, a very intriguing talk, which I enjoyed very much. I have a simple question of the first part. Yes. Um, if I think it totally classically, as you said, it is a classical system. Mm -hmm. And I can see your waveguide system is a little bit like you have two oscillators simultaneously coupled to a third oscillator. Mm -hmm. And between these two oscillators, there is no coupling. Yeah. Now, my question is, is this Step wrap effect, a general effect of such a coupled oscillator system, or do you need to engineer the coupling rate of these three oscillator systems? Yes, the so physics is old physics. I mean, if you have three pendula, and if you take the two outer pendula in an anti-symmetric movement, the center pendula is not moving. Yeah, also the pendula okay. are, are still still coupled. If you slightly disturb the system, you will see how the disturbance just moves through the three pendula geometry. So I'm not at all claiming that this is that, that this is new physics. All I was saying is that this can be realized in a magnonic environment. And I wanted to point out, actually, I wanted to stimulate people like you to pick up this idea and to use this now for, 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 for new ideas, how to, how to invent um, better uh, spin wave computation mechanism. Great. Yeah, uh, the that's... good thing, your, the second part of your question is, of course, if you think a little bit more about it, you will immediately come up with all different kinds of, of how to manipulate this from outside. Yeah, you can take you, you, you can pump the center wave guide. I showed you an experiment where we changed the damping. You can you, uh, you can change it. Uh, I mean, all these waveguides were assumed to be parallelly magnetized. You can also discuss anti parallel magnetization in this way to have some storage, uh, you know, capability in the system. I think there is a multitude of, of, of ways in which you can think this kind of devices. I only wanted to point out that we can transfer these ideas into magnonic and I found it personally very interesting to have something like this dark state um, because it mediates uh, population without being excited. Excellent. With that actually insight, I, I would like to give you an analogy of this dark state. I'm not sure whether you agree with me or not. If you can see this setup, which I have at my hand, it's yeah. just a Newton's cradle. Yeah, but you have to switch off your, your, your background because yeah, it's a little bit awkward. I have this yeah. background. I don't know how it's, to switch. It's, but it's just a three yeah. pendulum. Newton's yeah, okay. cradle. Yeah. If you take the left one, let it swing. The middle one will stay in the position. Is yeah. that exactly the duck mode of your system? Uh, I would say it is. I wouldn't say exactly because we have a continuous transfer of population where there's a stray field and you have an impulsive transfer in your case. But right. if you take this little detail aside, it's the same thing. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for the nice demo. Uh, next question, Professor Kovlev, please uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, hi. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, so I have a question. So in uh, quantum computing, uh, the advantage of quantum computer can be quantified by so-called quantum supremacy. Mm -hmm. uh, so here, if we can simulate our magnonic 
computer on a classical computer, for example, with Mumex, uh, then how do you quantify the uh, supremacy of Magnonic computer, for example? Yeah, I, tr I tried to indicate what what has what, what needs to be done. Or maybe I just misunderstood something. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not. I'm, please do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying that I found a better solution for quantum computing. All I was saying is, if you go into wave-based computing, it also includes optics, for instance. Yeah, then you have a window of opportunity between classical Boolean logic and quantum computing, which can be very interesting because algorithms exist, which do not depend on, 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 on entangled states. But that then, uh, can we quantify the advantage over classical computer? Like, or what would be the advantage over classical computer? Yeah, these, uh, these, these algorithms are still polynomial. That is the point. OK, so you can achieve some kind of polynomial advantage. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I see. All right. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Proshko. Please go ahead with that uh, question. Thank you, Burkhardt. Very nice talk. So, uh, actually, can we uh, somehow uh, make an insight in this thermalization of magnons? Uh, how they uh, how that happens actually? We, what is the predominant channel of thermalization in the simulations? So you can map that now all the clouds how they go go down. Yeah. Yeah, Dima, I, I feel so sorry that, that the time was limited and I had to make a selection what I can show and what I have to, to keep away. Uh, you, you, you can imagine, I, I showed you already, actually, let's see, I showed you already uh, some stages of, 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 of exactly what, what, what you are asking. And the stages are just here. Um, so this is stage number one, only pumping of the magnons. Yeah, you see, we pump here and we pump there. I hope you can yep. see it also in the, in, in, on the screen, yeah. And then the next step is the four magnon scattering. I showed you this picture. I showed you another one, which you see here. Yeah. And then uh, if we switch off the pumping, we see all the intermediates. We see the magnon gas here. These are all magnon gas states in our usual uh, uh, language convention. And we see how the condensates are forming here. Yeah. But and, Worker, do you have it only in X, key X? So it's along the field. What happens with perpendicular branches there? So what uh, Yes, this can be simulated. Yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't have it here. I don't even know whether, whether uh, Morteza has done it. But if you send us a request, I understand your question as a request, we will simulate it. I remember there's this very old question, which actually I think you raised, how is actually in detail going in a three dimension, in a two dimensional manner, the scattering process going ahead? Yeah. And this, of course, would be a nice bachelor or master or by just the master thesis, just to inter in investigate this, this thing. So this is fairly new, as you might know. And, and there's many things we now can, we can study on the computer. Yeah. Thank you, Burkhardt. Uh, next question, Joe Wang, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So I have a question. Uh, maybe I uh, miss it. So after the uh, magnum condensate created, do we have a finite lifetime of that, or is it stay there? Yeah. So what the typical lifetime of that and what parameters determine the lifetime? The, the lifetime is the lifetime of magnons in YIC. And that is typically, I mean, we can all fight for that, something between 500 nanosecond and a microsecond. Uh, we can extend the lifetime by parametric uh, regeneration that is possible. Um, but we like to work in a mode where we generate the Bose-Einstein condensate after pumping, and then we simply work with the decaying condensates. Uh, it is also possible that you work with the condensates during pumping. Then, of course, you can maintain them for infinitely long. But, but then you are always working in a... We feel that, that our, our condensates are closer to equilibrium than if you do it during pumping. But this is only a technical aspect. Yeah, you, you can work in both regimes. And you might already infer the particular proper advantages and disadvantages of, of these two things. We can do more. We can, of course, work with, with a decaying condensate and then periodically reestablish it. That is also possible. Yeah. 
You might know that parametric pumping is phase sensitive, so we can maintain the phase of the condensate this way. So that is all, there's, there's all plenty of room for, for, for uh, experiments. Thank you. Yeah, we are simply not fast enough to do it all because this is all new stuff and uh, we had to make a selection what to do first and I'm showing you today just this, this is very recent results. Great. Uh, Dima, do you have another question? Uh, actually, actually, just looking at this condensate, so in simulations you don't have two magnet scattering, right? But oh, or we can add, we, we don't have two magnet scattering, you are right, Diva. We simply have switched it off because two magnet scattering is uh, scattering from imperfections. Yeah, exactly. So uh, basically, you, uh, you, uh, you should have that in the real life. So uh, especially if you pattern the, the things down to nanostructure, uh, so you will have def a lot of defects. Yeah. So what you would, uh, how you would, estimate uh, the ro uh, role of two magnet scattering in uh, basically decoherence time of uh, your qubit. Yeah, but what we know from other experiments, actually from the, from the time dependent experiments, is that if you have two magnet scattering, the condensation process is faster. Yeah, because you provide another mechanism, um, another mechanism, um, how to how to that this in equilibrium situation can converge to as an equilibrium situation for two reasons. Number one, with two magnet scattering, you, you, you also increase the Gilbert damping. You can describe it with increased Gilbert damping. Term. Also, if you have two magnet scattering, I would always favor not only to do to study scattering from some imperfections in the material, but also to, to add Cherenkov scattering because Cherenkov scattering turned out to be very efficient for letting a magnon gas relax into the condensate. So these parameters, I think it's mostly just time constants which, which, which are changed. So the condensation goes faster, the condensate doesn't live for so long, both, but, but you still might be under favorable conditions. If you are now wants to give us an order what we have to do, uh, I would say it's not hard to do. Yeah, in a computer, just to switch this and that cell off, and in this way to simulate just some 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 structural imperfections, or to include locally uh, just some frequency dependent absorption, like we would have if we have Cherenkov scattering, that can be easily implemented. But please, Dima, we are trying to move forward, um, and we are not that long having this kind of tool available. Well, thank you, uh, but. You see, it generates a lot of uh, lots of uh, interesting questions, and uh, the new ideas just going going not in the uh, in the depth, but in the, like yeah. in the horizontal Indeed. way. Uh, you generate a dozen of ideas, yeah, and, and you know from other work from which we have done in Kaiserslautern that a lot of other interesting effects come in. For instance, we will have caustic effects for the phonon system. We have never studied the interaction between caustic effects and Bose-Einstein condensates, which is certainly somewhere high on our to-do list. But but that is just a characteristic property of a new developing field that you can quickly come up with new ideas. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Karthik. Please go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, great talk. Um, I'm having a little trouble understanding the analogy between uh, the uh, transition uh, from energy state one to three and three to two and uh, uh, between uh, two to three and then one to three. So you started explaining it as to be the latter to be counterintuitive and wouldn't be efficient, but it turned out to be efficient. Um, but now I'm trying to place how the three YIG waveguides are separated in energy. I can see a photonic equivalence where we have a bus waveguide and two micro rings where you have light coupling from say one to three or you know one to two or two to one, but the uh, magnonic equivalence seems to be a little confusing to me. Yeah, I might have not pointed it out well enough. I showed you this picture and then I showed you the optic realization and this picture is the same like our geometry we do exactly copy the optic situation the only difference is we have turned this picture by 90 degree and then it looks like this yeah because yeah. now the propagation is not like here from 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 the bottom to the top 
but still you see here you have the first narrow here and the second narrow there and here you have the first narrow here and the second narrow there but otherwise it's exactly the same all we have done is replacing the photons or let's better say the electromagnetic waves mm -hmm. with, with, with the spin waves here in this case that's that's all okay all right okay yeah that makes sense and, and uh, if i may yeah, and I did not show you more, exp we have done much, many more experiments. Um, one, of course, is also control experiments, for instance, what happens if you change the direction of magnetization and then so on and so on. Yeah. Uh, if I may ask one more question. Um, so uh, how do you envision the uh, coherent magnonics are benefiting or maybe not benefiting uh, by using something like a compensated ferry magnet, uh, maybe not right at compensation temperature, but close to compensation temperature, where you still have some non-zero angular momentum? Yeah, I mean, that is a very, very interesting question. We did everything in YIC. We used only the ferromagnetic property of YIC in our description. So the net magnetic moment was it's a ferromagnetic material. We can use the higher states. Sometimes they play a role if it comes to thermalization, but they are energy wise far away from the from this from the gigahertz states i was, I was showing to you uh, this will certainly be an, another very interesting research direction yeah. i mean what is good about interference based magnonics or interference based photonics the same thing is that intrinsically the footprint is lower you can realize logic functionalities which much less space if the intrinsic length scale in our case is the wavelength and then in the in the, in the CMOS case is just the feature size is the same uh, so that is one one advantage and the other is uh, we work with the wavelengths of magnons at the moment we don't like to make it very small because we would like to look with Bruno and light scattering on it so the limiting factor here is the wavelength of the light we use for the experiment yeah but we have we have had uh, magnons uh, we can easily make magnons in in YIC even under certain conditions conditions with, with, with a wavelength of only a couple of 10 nanometers and we can even go beyond and if you go to the exchange regime then the modes are all exchange but that is not a fundamental difficulty uh, then this works and if you go to the exchange regime of course you cannot work with dipolar coupling anymore then you have to use exchange coupling in my view that is not a fundamental barrier it, it is of course a challenge for the nanofabrication yeah because then you have to couple through ultras and intermediate films like the old the old Grunberg work you remember where you had iron chromium iron and chromium was only a couple of, of nanometers so this all will come back but could be used for for the same purpose here we simply have space the waveguide side by side there is no reason why you could not just stack them and change the, the thickness in between get the same functionality i should stop here but but i think i could indicate that, that there are many ways how to realize this and in this way you will move to the higher frequencies you can use other branches of the dispersion in ferrite magnets um, if you have good tools how to excite spin waves in anti magnets potentially I don't see roadblocks there. Also, I don't know at the moment how to do it. It just needs a little bit more research and more, more ideas how to do it. But fundamentally, that should be proper. All we need is just a, a finite lifetime, is propagation over a certain distance. So we need a group velocity. Uh, it doesn't work with both Einstein condensates because you have seen the group velocity there is zero, so they don't move, so you cannot make a, a stir up device with a both Einstein condensate, but that is another story. Yeah. And what you need is nonlinearity. I think that should always be pointed out. There is a big advantage which distincts our magnonics work from photonics work. In photonics, you always have to play lots of tricks to get a nonlinear medium into the system, but but the Maxwell equations are linear and, 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 and our Lando Lucius Gilbert equations are nonlinear. That is our, our maybe biggest asset here. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that's very informative. Great. Uh, do we have another question? Uh, Karthik, do you have another question? Your hands was raised. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I will remove that. I'm still learning the ways of Zoom. Sure. Uh, Joe, you have another question? Yes, I have a very short question. So in the introduction slide, you show that uh, if there are more nodes, then the energy is higher. I think uh, which I cannot really 
understand. Yeah, I show you. Um, you you read this one here. Yeah, uh, it's 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 very simple. There are many ways how to explain it. Here I provide my most favorite one. Um, think about the black mode, the red mode, and the blue mode. Yeah, and think about what kind of stray fields they will generate outside of the system. Yeah, after all, this is an in-play magnetized film. So if so, if you have some moments which process like this, if this is a film plane, so the precession generates an out of plane moment, which generates a stray field. Yeah? And it is very clear, the mode with the largest stray field is a black one. Yeah? Here, these two half waves compensate each other because they are 180 degree out of phase. So the total stray field of this mode is lower. Yeah. Uh, and this one is this one again is lower. So if you just fix a wave vector just here, yeah, then you see the highest frequency is this one, yeah, because uh, there's all the straight field energy, and the others one are correspondingly lower. That is one way how to understand it. Yeah. The other is really just to solve some the, the, the mathematical problem of a wave which is laterally confined by some boundary condition here at the edges of the stripe. Yeah. You can solve the problem, and if you do so, it's a straightforward, uh, somewhat complicated calculation, but it, it, uh, originally it's very straightforward. Then you just get here these, these, these full lines, which you see here in the diagram. Does this sufficiently answer your question? Yeah, I got the. I personally prefer always to think in terms of stray fields because stray field mm -hmm. means stray field energy, and there's not, nothing free in the world uh, for energy. You always have to pay for energy, and uh, this, this might guide your, your 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 thinking. Yes, yes. Thank you. Great. Do you have other question or comment, Adima? Burkert, if you uh, if you look at stir up classic stir up process, you uh, you have their energy transitions between energy levels. Mm -hmm. right? In your uh, in your scenario, you have uh, three wave guides which share the same energy levels. Yeah. Right, and uh, and you just uh, change the space to uh, energy space into the actually wave vector space in that sense. Yeah, I, I, that is the difference from our stir up. Therefore, we like to call it wave vector scale stir up. <coughs> Excuse me, please. Compared to to, to, to energy scale stir up. Yeah. In molecular physics, you don't have a wave vector because everything is small. Yeah, you only discuss this, which certain energy and some other quantum numbers yeah uh, but that's it uh, and since the energy states are discrete you just work with a set of quantum numbers in our system and that is different we have the wave vector which is a continuous variable and that makes it different but we have quantization again finite size effects which only allow certain wavelengths like you have seen in the animation of, of the waveguide and this translate into discrete wave vectors but you have continuum in the longitudinal wave vector, right? No, uh, but what do you mean with longitudinal? In the, the wave vector for propagation. So along the waveguide, of course, you have a full continuum of the states. Oh, that's right. Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah, that's right. And you that don't is... change the mode, right? You don't change the width, uh, width mode as you jump over the different waveguides. So it's always stays the same. Yeah, in this uh, case, yes, because these waveguides have been made identical, which means the same widths and the same thickness, same material. Yeah, you're right. Uh, you, not, nobody prevents you to have two unequal waveguides, but probably the coupling would be less efficient. Uh, yeah unless you use some very specific conditions. Different magnetization compensated by different thicknesses or something like that, yeah. Would you imagine then, the, uh, if you have an equal web guys, that you will have a mixture with uh, uh, angular momentum, uh, conservation plus uh, difference in energy levels. So you will have uh, more close analogy to the classical stir up, if I can, can call uh, stir up as classical. 
Yeah, of, of course, I have to, to think about it um, because you have to, I mean, if the waveguides are absolutely identical, then, it, then it's very clear. Yeah, the propagation direction is the same. So, for instance, if you have unequal waveguides, the, 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 the wavelengths here are certainly different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, the energy is the same in this case because you you cannot change the energy of the system. You drive it, but you, you you must make sure that in the other waveguide you still have a propagating wave and not a driven wave, which would then evanescently die out. But uh, yeah, but you might think about conditions where this still is fulfilled. I take a material with a different saturation magnetization compensated by the widths so that you have the same uh, frequency available, then probably it works. Yeah. Could be an interesting case because the angular momentum is different in the case. So the question is simply, what is the physics behind a different angular momentum? So where does yeah. the additional angular momentum come from? Can you see it as an additional damping for yeah. because of mismatch? So these kind of things, of course, are interesting questions. Okay, thank you. Great. Do we have another question? Now, if not, at this moment, we're going to stop the live streaming and the recording. I want to thank uh, Professor Hillebrand again for, for giving a very interesting talk.